So now I want to move on to talk about the two schools of thought in macroeconomics. If you ever pay attention to the media, you may find that whenever there is an economic phenomenon, for example, the economy is not doing well, there will always be a lot of debate in the media about what the government should do. So in here, I want to tell you why there is a debate and it is not surprising at all from the perspective of the development of macroeconomics. So the development of macroeconomics turned out to have two schools of thoughts. So given that there are two schools of thoughts, so it is not surprising at all. There are some debates. But then why there are two schools of thoughts instead of one unified thoughts? So now let's begin the story of the macroeconomic development. So macroeconomics is a sub subject of economics. And so then we need to talk about that what is the basic foundation of the subject economics. Then we can start to think about the development of the sub subject macroeconomics. So if you may recall from your class Econ 1, that is the principle economics, you learned that economics start from the book of Adam Smith in 1776, The Wealth of Nations. In that book, we know that he brought up the key concept of economics, that there is always supply side of the economy, there is always demand side of the economy, and there exists an invisible hand in the market that coordinating the supply and the demand of the market such that the price, which is the invisible hand, will be able to equate the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. So then the development of macroeconomics also based on this important assumption. And this first school of thought is called classical approach. So under this approach, when we want to study the performance of an economy, we made three assumptions. The first assumption is that everyone pursues their own self-interest. The second assumption is that changes in prices coordinate people's action. The third assumption is that the price adjusts rapidly to the equilibrium in all markets. Given that everyone is pursuing their own self-interest, so the supplier will maximize its own benefits. So in usual case, the households are suppliers, so they maximize the utility and making the decision about how much capital and how much labor they want to supply. On the other hand, for the demander, which is usually the firms, they also maximize their self-interest, which is the profit, and then they choose how much capital and labor they want to demand such that they will be able to put all of them into the production process. So then the suppliers are making their own decisions. The demander also making their own decisions. Then they interact in the market and then the price will coordinate the decision of the supplier and the demander because once people see the price, they know how much they want to supply. Once they see the price, they know how much they want to demand. So then under the classical approach, given that we assume that the price adjusts rapidly to equilibrium in all market, which means that the quantity of supply will equal to the quantity demanded. So it means that the market is functioning so well. Because of that, the positive recommendation of the classical approach in general believe that the government has limited role or the government should not intervene in the market at all. This is because the market is functioning really well and everyone is conducting the business in their self best interest. Any intervention in the market by the government will intervene the functioning of the invisible hand and create market failure. So the classical approach dominates the macroeconomic study in the 1800s to the early 1900s. But then something happened in 1929. Do you remember what happened in 1929? That is the Great Depression in the US. People find out that during that time, somehow a lot of people got unemployed. 
given that a lot of people got unemployed, it implies that the labor supply is higher than the labor demand. If the labor market is functioning well, the wages should fall, and then it will again equating the quantity of labor supplied to the quantity labor demand. However, it is not the fact what we observe. We find out that during Great Depression, labor market kept to be off the equilibrium. The wage cannot adjust to restore the equilibrium. So people start to doubt the classical approach during the Great Depression because the classical approach has an important assumption that is the market can function well. But obviously, during Great Depression, the market doesn't function well. There is an obvious labor market failure. Therefore, people start to think about, is there any way to modify the traditional classical approach in analyzing the macro phenomenon? So then, here comes the second school of thought of macroeconomics. That is the concept proposed by John Keynes in 1936. This school of thought make um, assumptions that are completely different from the assumption of the classical approach. They assume that the market can be out of the equilibrium for a long period, such that we will observe that the price and wages will adjust slowly. And because the wages and the prices adjust slowly, so the market cannot function well, and so the government should intervene to help the market to function well. Therefore, based on the assumption of the Keynesian approach, we know that the policy recommendation of this school of thought will tend to be different from the classical approach. That is because under the Keynesian approach, we assume that the invisible hand somehow is sleeping. So then we need someone to wake it up and the government will play a role to wake it up to help the market function well to coordinating the supply and the demand. Therefore, the positive recommendation of the Keynesian approach tend to suggest that government intervention is necessary sometimes to help the economy to perform better. So as you can see from looking at these two approaches side by side, you will find out that these two approaches make two different assumptions. One assumes that the market is functioning well, therefore the policy recommendation is that the government has a limited role. However, the other approach, that is a Keynesian approach, assumes that the market is not functioning well and the government should intervene to help this market to restore the equilibrium. So then the Keynesian school of thought dominates the development of the macro research ever since the Great Depression. If that is the end of the story, then there will not be half two school of thought in macroeconomics nowadays. So then what happened afterwards such that causes the failure of the Keynesian approach. As the Great Depression is an important evidence showing that the assumption of the classical approach fell. There should be another event similar to Great Depression that somehow suggests that the key assumption of the Keynesian approach fell. So given that the Keynesian approach assumes that the price and wages adjust slowly, so it must be something happened later on. We find out that the price and wages still can adjust, but we still observe the recession. And that is what happened in 1970s. During the time, the economy experienced recession, but different from Great Depression, this time, the price adjusts rapidly. Therefore, we observe the stagflation, that is stagnation plus inflation. So which means that 
The Keynesian approach somehow blamed the recession in 1929 to the misfunction of the market. The price is sticky such that the economy is off the equilibrium, so the economy is in recession. But this explanation cannot explain the stagflation in the 1970s. So at last, now the Keynesian approach also fell. So then after the 1970s, the Keynesian approach no longer dominates the macro research. So then the, for the economies that is pro-classical approach, they start to adjust their research approach and think about a way that they can account for the Great Depression and the stagflation in the 1970s. And for this modified classical macro research, we call it the new classical approach. Similarly, for the scholars that is pro the Keynesian approach, they also think about a way to modify their research approach. Instead of assuming that the price and wages adjust slowly and take it as given, they start to introduce the mechanisms to explain why the price is sticky, such that they will be able to also explain the stagflation in the 1970s. For this modification, we call the new Keynesian approach. So now we have the coexistence of two schools of thought in macroeconomics. One is built on the classical approach, but they try to explain the business cycles, which allows short-term deviation from the equilibrium, and we call it the newer classical approach. The other school of thoughts based on the Keynesian approach, but adding mechanism to explain why the price and wages adjust slowly, and we call it the new Keynesian approach. So this is the two school of thoughts in macroeconomics. So let me wrap up the discussion in here by a small chart so that we will be able to have a clear picture about the evolution of macro research. We said that the macro study starts from the classical approach at the very beginning, but then the Great Depression in 19. 29 is an evidence that suggesting that the key assumption of the classical approach can be invalid. So then there is a fail of the classical approach. That is because the fundamental of the assumption is obviously deviated away from the actual fact that we observe in during Great Depression. So then there is a rise of the Keynesian view. But it is not the end of the story. It turned out that in the 1970s, where there is stagflation, it also shows the evidence that the fundamental assumption of the Keynesian approach doesn't work well because it assumes that the market is not functioning well, such that the wages and the prices adjust slowly, and then the economy is in recession. But then in 1970s, the prices still adjust rapidly, but we still observe the recession. So we say the stagflation is an important economic phenomenon that suggests that the traditional Keynesian approach doesn't work. So then the two schools of thoughts try to modify their research approach, and there comes the neoclassical approach and the new Keynesian approach. And so that's why nowadays we have two schools of thoughts in macroeconomics, even though they build on different assumptions, but both explain the economic phenomena that we observe nowadays. So we say that even though there are two schools of thoughts in macro, but they have unified thoughts somehow. In macro, we say that the first unification in macro research of the two schools of thoughts is that both schools of thoughts believe that the individuals, firms, and government interact in the goods market, ASA market, and labor market in the aggregated level. There is no doubt for that. The second one is that the individuals are maximizing their economic satisfaction 
That is, the household maximize their utility given the budget constraint, the firm maximize their profits given their production technology, and then this agents interact in the market and they determine the supply and demand of the goods, the, the labor, and then in the long run, that the price and the wages can fully adjust with no doubt to achieve the equilibrium of the market. But in the short run, we do allow some deviations from the equilibrium. So even though there are two school of thoughts in macro, there are some uh, agreements about the fundamental assumptions of macro research. So this completed discussion related to the two school of thoughts in macroeconomics.